Hey guys, and welcome to the final wrap-up of the main story summary of Trails in the Sky the Third. It's time to face the truth of Kevin and Reese's past as the group tries to escape Phantasma. Now let's pick up right where we left off after Kevin's complete collapse. There's a flashback of Kevin when he was still just a squire of the Grawls Ritter. He's being addressed by the First Dominion, who also expresses her sadness over Rufina's death. Though she reminds Kevin that paying the ultimate price is a fact of life, especially for them due to the nature of their dangerous missions. But Kevin just tells her to kill him, saying that he has no reason to live anymore. Ayn sharply reprimands him, saying he has no right to ask for that after going through the Grawls Ritter vows of pledging their bodies and souls to the goddess and her church on earth. She relays the information from the Congregation of the Sacraments and the Pope that he is to take the position of Fifth Dominion, which has been vacant for the past couple decades. He's also to begin thinking of a title for himself, as all Dominions do so upon their promotion. Apparently, the High Cardinal himself expects Kevin to fulfill some very big shoes, since Rufina's problem-solving abilities and capabilities were considered greater than even some of the Dominion, despite her lack of a stigma. Her loss is keenly felt by the Church, the implication being that Kevin must make up for such a loss. Furthermore, the refusal of promotion to Dominion is unprecedented throughout the entirety of Church history. Kevin is dumbfounded that his promotion is essentially due to Rufina's death. He bitterly and hysterically laughs before accepting his position, asking Ayn to pile on as much work they possibly can on him. The flashback ends as he quickly decides on the title, The Heretic Hunter. Chapter 5 begins back in the present as everyone is catching Estelle up to speed on Phantasma. They summarize the three most essential questions they're still investigating. Who is the Lord of Phantasma and his servant? What is the cube and the identity of the ghost? And what is Phantasma and how did it come to exist? Estelle is pretty quick to catch on when it's put in these terms, but she's also curious as to how Kevin's fainting fits into the picture. Those who were present while fighting Estart mention the red symbol that appeared on his back, but otherwise they're not sure what happened. Joshua thinks it could be the result of a stigma, which understandably catches everyone's attention. However, he thinks Kevin's was significantly stronger than the one Wiseman carved into his mind. Reese returns at that very moment to confirm that it indeed was a stigma. She says that what Kevin did placed a heavy burden on his mind, so he will need to rest for a while. Reese clarifies that the difference between Joshua's and Kevin's stigmas is due to the latter's being one of the original kinds, one that is carved into the very soul of the person and that only manifests in the Grawls Ritter dominions. Estelle asks what a dominion is, and Olivier mentions hearing rumors about how the Grawls Ritter are led by a group of 12 knights called the Dominion. Reese clarifies that the stigma the Dominion possess allow them to perform the highest levels of thaumaturgy and enables them to strengthen their bodies beyond what is thought humanly possible. Finally, she confirms for the group what the player has known for a long time now, that Kevin is the fifth Dominion. Everyone is pretty shocked and confused that easygoing Kevin disposes of heretics. Chloe asks if Kevin's stigma appeared the same way Joshua's had, but it's revealed that true stigmas manifest in their own manner without any other human intervention. Because they are so rare, there has never been more than 12 dominion at once. There are even periods of time, such as in Kevin's instance, that a certain position goes unfulfilled for decades. But the main point is that the said person is always out there, whether their stigma has manifested yet or not. The group also learns that Kevin was originally sent by the church to execute Wiseman for all the literature and techniques he stole during his time as a clergyman, which he then transferred to Ouroboros, including the knowledge of how stigmas work. Olivier opens up a can of worms when he asks if collapsing is a normal occurrence after the use of a stigma. Reese says that's not necessarily the case, then looks off, unsure of why Kevin rarely uses his stigma, the only exception being to dispose of the irredeemable sinners. Finally, Reese is met with no objections when she asks if everyone would be alright with her leading the way until Kevin recovers. Estelle asks Reese if she'll include her on the exploration team, claiming that it'll help her get a tangible feel for what's going on. 
Reese is happy to accept the Bracer's help, and the team heads out towards the new warp portal. However, before they step onto it, Reese asks Estelle why she specifically put her name forward to help her. The girls Ritter Squire basically wonders how Estelle's eyes could be filled with such resolve to assist her when they're basically strangers. The Estelle we know and love claims that she didn't really think of a big special reason to do so, but if she could put a finger on it, it's because she's grateful for what Kevin has done for her, Joshua, and everyone else. Reese is confused about how helping her out translates to helping Kevin, and Estelle is rather shocked that she doesn't realize how important she is to the Dominion. Estelle says that it's easy to see how the two are basically family, but Reese is doubtful since they haven't met in five years and only reunited due to work. The Bracer repeats words that we know comes from Cassius, that once formed, bonds can never be broken. The fact that Kevin so instinctively trusted Reese with the cube, and the fact that Reese understands what Kevin is thinking so well is proof that their bond is still strong. Grateful for the reassurance and pep talk, Reese thanks Estelle and the four finally teleport to the fifth plane. They're greeted by an expansive labyrinth located in a glowing golden space. The devils they encounter in this new area specifically attack the mind, so they cautiously advance through the expanse. They finally come across the ceiling stone, which surprisingly adds former Colonel Richard of all people to their ranks. His initial surprise turns to uncertainty as he notices that everyone collected so far are all comrades who succeed in turning the darkest circumstances around for the better. He believes it must have been a mistake for a traitor like him to be summoned to join this group. Everyone tries to offer reassurance by reminding him of his help during Ouroboros' takeover of Grand Soul, but it's not until Josette speaks up that he gains a different perspective. Even though they both did terrible things to the girl in the past, they both chose to move past and make up for it. Further into the fifth plane, the background dimension grows dark and ominous. They come across another ceiling stone, which happens to contain Ren. She appears to be having a nightmare about her parents before she wakes up. She sleepily notices Estelle, Joshua, and even Tita, then thinks about how nice of a dream she's having. Estelle rushes forward to embrace the young girl, and Ren allows herself to feel comforted by the bracer. However, she finally realizes that this is reality, and quickly jumps away from Estelle. She shrieks at her not to come any closer, so Joshua tries to speak with her instead. Ren screams at the two to stop following her all over the continent and to just leave her alone, while Estelle apologizes for being the one who keeps pursuing her, the search finally landing them in Crossbell State. Ren seems panicked but soon turns smug, telling the Brights that they've wasted their time trying to capture her since she knows only as much about Ouroboros as Joshua. Estelle futilely tries to convince her that the purpose of their search isn't to get information out of her, when Reese finally steps forward and tells Ren to stop acting like a spoiled child. It turns out Reese has finally identified her as Enforcer 15 and states that she has no intention of working with someone from Ouroboros. Ren recognizes her weapon and attire as part of the Graz Ritter, and the two prepare to battle each other. However, Tita suddenly yells at both of them to stop. The small girl rushes between the two, first shouting at Ren to stop denying her feelings of happiness when Estelle was embracing her earlier. Then she yells at Reese for trying to fight Ren, since the older girl must have noticed that she isn't really a bad person despite once serving Ouroboros. She turns back to Ren, trying to get her to realize that the things she said, like how she doesn't want to see or talk to Estelle and Joshua anymore, are complete lies. Tita explains it one more time before she breaks down in tears. Ren bends down next to Tita, wondering why she's crying. Estelle has to tell Ren it's because she sees her as a precious friend. The Bracer then asks the young girl to a truce for the time being, since getting out of Phantasma is of the utmost importance. Ren says she'll spare the group this time out of respect for Tita's bravery, then asks to be filled in on the current situation. 
After the briefing, she draws attention to how Richard has appeared in an outfit that reminds him of the past he mentally can't leave behind yet. He catches on and realizes that Phantasma is able to change according to people's thoughts. However, the overall structure of this world must be the cause of one person's thoughts alone, the Lord of Phantasmas. Ren whips out her genius and pieces together that said figure isn't originally from this world, but has overpowered the ghost who has been here since Phantasma's conception. This new lord has now been restructuring this world according to their own whims. At the end of the fifth plane, they unsurprisingly encounter some arachnid devils, known for weaving nightmares, mentioned in the church testaments. After defeating the gigantic spider's final form, they are presented with a stone that's not golden, but silver. Schwartz Ritter appears again, though he didn't expect to have to so soon. Apparently he underestimated the host of Gransel's finest tea party. Estelle then asks where he got such information. Schwartz Ritter only replies that the final stone they received contains a sort of rule book about Phantasma. Finally, he warns them that the final plane contains specific trials that they must overcome. He claims that even he'll serve as one. Then he disappears. They teleport back to the hub and Reese presents the final stone to the monument. Chloe says the light radiating from the stone feels nostalgic, and the group is finally able to see and hear the female ghost clearly. She welcomes Chloe, one of her descendants, and the rest of her friends to her garden, finally introducing herself as Celeste D. Osliza. The scene fades into a flashback once more. Girls Ritter Squire Kevin is seen happily chatting with Rufina over the phone. She apologizes that she'll end up late due to a delayed train, so Kevin says he'll wait where he currently is so they can head over to visit Reese together for the first time in two years. Just as he ends the call, the priest rushes over to him. He saw a group of men in black heading towards the mountain path. They're likely heading to Aster House, so Kevin heads there on his own. Concealed behind a group of trees, Kevin figures that the men are Jaegers and prepares to confront them as the flashback ends. Chapter 6 begins as Celeste finally answers the questions about Phantasma and her involvement here. The Celeste figure that is talking to them now is merely a copy of the original's personality and was created to influence Phantasma. This world itself was created several thousands of years ago by the Oriole and is located on the higher plane of existence. This self-organized world basically served as a realm in which the Oriole could use to grant humanities every wish and desire, though Phantasma is not actually a part of the Oriole itself. Celeste and the Rubble Group noticed this realm as they were making preparations to seal the Liber Arc away. They originally thought their plans would be impossible to execute since the Oriole had absolute control over space itself and could influence their every thought and action. However, they were able to develop the Recluse Cube, the only object that can interact with Phantasma without having to go through the Oriole. Celeste used the cube to create a copy of her personality as well as a hermit's garden within Phantasma in order to begin sabotaging this world's functionality. The Oriole's processing ability was hindered just enough to allow the rubble group to successfully seal the Septarian away. Celeste's copy fell into deep slumber, but was prepared to reawaken in case the Oriole was ever unsealed. Just recently though, the Lord of Phantasma appeared in this world, stealing all of Celeste's power before she even knew what was happening. He then began creating the new dimensional planes, confirming Ren's theory. But even Celeste has no idea why and how the Lord of Phantasma has been able to do all of this. They must hurry to figure out his goal though, since Celeste can feel the dark, inhumane thoughts of the seventh and final plane seeping into the others. Kevin's voice suddenly chimes in, suggesting he might know what the Lord of Phantasma is up to. Everyone is relieved to see him back on his feet, especially Reese. Kevin claims he can think of only one person who is twisted enough to do all of this, a cunning, arrogant, cold-hearted son of a bitch who doesn't see people as people. Though Kevin says he needs one more piece of info, likely on the sixth plane, to confirm his theory. 
He asked the group if they're willing to wait for the final answer, swearing it on the goddess's name and the church emblem. Annalise sums it up well, that Kevin rarely asks for favors. Celeste begins researching into the seventh plane as the group heads out to explore the sixth. But right before they leave, Kevin asks Reese to please leave everything to him. She agrees as long as he doesn't do anything to make Rufina sad. The new plane is located in what looks like the Irby Scenic Route. They reach a monument containing a riddle that asks for Chloe, and once the princess is in the ranks, they're teleported to a creepy monochrome version of Genis Royal Academy where fiends are wandering about. The trick here is to only defeat the enemies of a dark color while avoiding the red ones. After all the necessary ones are taken out, color is restored completely to the area. Here begins a series of boss fights against copies of very familiar people scattered throughout this entire chapter. First off is Agate's old gang, and once the group heads into the old schoolhouse, they're met with none other than Butler Philip, a former captain of the Royal Guard. After a pretty interesting fight, the group heads off to the next monument, which asks for Annalise. The new area is reminiscent of Ouroboros' secret lab in Liberal. First up is Grant, followed by Karna, then we eventually reach Kurt. Kilika, of all people, serves as the final opponent on the rooftop. It's great to have Zinn in the party for this one, since he comments that Kilika was even stronger than Walter when armed with her chakrams. After defending against her weapons, they head to the next monument, which requests Richard. The next area appears to be a copy of Lyston Fortress. The first opponent is Major Sid, followed by Captain Amalthea, then we're treated to General Morgan in action for the first time. The final fight is against none other than a Mr. Cassius Bright. As always, he appears to be more in the know than anyone, commenting that he thought the Oriole mess was already over and that even Ragnar couldn't have predicted these events. Richard addresses Cassius, telling him that he'll finally be able to leave his hesitation behind once he defeats the one who taught him everything. Cassius tells Estelle that he reads all the letters she and Joshua sends to him and hopes they're doing well. Reese introduces herself to Cassius, catching his surprise by her last name. He tells her about the many years back when Rufina was known by a small portion of the upper ranked racers. She was regarded as the most skillful negotiator of the entire church, her problem solving skills and way of conducting missions aligning closely with the bracer way of doing things. So much so that the guild was preparing to ask her to join their ranks. But unfortunately, she passed away before full negotiations could get underway, Cassius offering his condolences to Kevin and Reese. And now, finally, the battle begins. After much difficulty, the group emerges victorious, Richard stating that he can now move forward with pride along the new path he has chosen for himself. Cassius's parting words to Kevin is that no man is an island. No one can live their life truly alone no matter how much they may wish to. The final monument asks for Joshua and warps them to a replica of the Glorious. The group finds Gilbert trapped in the prison cells and actually takes the time to free him. The first of the boss fights features Don and Kyle, then once the group makes it to the bridge of the ship, they must face off against three familiar Ouroboros enforcers, Loblanc, Walter, and Luciola, all at once. The final portal in this place belongs to a lonely area called the Farewell Arena. They climb a massive flight of stairs and finally encounter Schwarzritter at the top. Before the battle, Joshua asks the man why he wears a mask, since everyone can tell that the Lord of Phantasma isn't forcing him to do it. It seems like the group has already figured out Schwarzritter's real identity, but the archaism that appears and the OST that plays during the battle makes the truth seem even more obvious. The end of the fight confirms the man's identity as his mask breaks. Joshua admits he was avoiding facing the truth of Schwarzritter's real identity, since he knew seeing Lo again would only be short-lived. In other words, it was Joshua's cognition that gave Schwarzritter that mask and Lo confirms that the mask was due to everyone else's thoughts, and not his own choosing. He finally addresses Kevin, asking if this final piece has confirmed his theory. The Dominion replies that he now has no doubt in his mind it's correct, and promises Lo he'll get everyone out safely. The Blade Lord tells Kevin he's counting on him, then slowly begins to fade away. 
Joshua tells Lo that he delivered his sword to Karen, and the two former enforcers share their final goodbyes before Lo disappears completely. The final seal in the sixth plane is lifted, and chapter 6 segues into chapter 7 as the party enters the final area of this plane. Reese is surprised, though Kevin isn't. He opens the gates and welcomes them all to Aster House, the place where he, Reese, and Rufina grew up. This orphanage is just one of the many places run by the Sepian Church called Gospel Facilities, which are basically a cross between an orphanage and a monastery. They begin exploring the grounds, Kevin and Reese recalling heartwarming memories in various places throughout, though Kevin shares that the matron was nothing like Matron Teresa at Mercia or orphanage. The kids at Astor House were apparently yelled at for the tiniest thing, though Reese says he deserved it since he never did anything the matron told him. In the kitchens, Kevin recounts how the older kids would cook for everyone. This also served as one of Reese's favorite places since she would sneak in whenever she was hungry. Trying to cover up her embarrassment, Reese tells the others not to take everything he says seriously. It turns out that Rufina was in here often as well, since she liked preparing meals for the younger kids. After she joined the girls' ritter though, Kevin and Reese took over her position. Reese butts in saying that the task was eventually left entirely to her after Kevin also left. In fact, he should cook something right now to make up for it. There's more light-hearted banter, then they head upstairs. In the young children's room, Reese recounts how Kevin didn't get along well with the other kids. He caused a lot of trouble for Rufina, who tried to help him make friends with the others. Kevin tells Reese he was surprised that she was friendly to him, since he was pretty nasty growing up. But Reese knew he was just trying to play the tough guy, like during the Rufina and Chocolate incidents. Reese teases him further when they reach the girls' room. Betty that Kevin was jealous when she took over her older sister's bed after she left. Though Reese is surprised at Kevin's reaction, expecting him to be more flustered. Kevin nips back when they enter the boys' bunk though, recounting how the opposite gender was not supposed to be in the other's room, but Reese did it all the time anyway. Of course, this was because she had to wake Kevin up for cleanup duty mornings. They finally try to enter the chapel, but find that the doors are locked. The party does a full-on search for the key, but is unable to find anything. Kevin finally recalls that Reese was on chapel cleanup duty on Astor House's final day, the very same day that Rufina died. He tells Reese to check her pockets, and sure enough, the key turns up. Before they head into the chapel, Kevin gives Reese one final warning that once they step inside, there'll be no going back. She'll be learning the truth of what happened that day, and she won't like it. But Reese stands resolute, saying she's been more than ready. All the kids were moved to different locations after the incidents, the life she knew coming to an abrupt end that day, and yet she still doesn't know why. She even tried to go back to Astor House before her Grawls Ritter training began, but by then the entire facility had already been demolished. She knows that facing the truth will allow her to become closer to Kevin and Rufina, so with that they finally enter the chapel doors. Before recounting the entire story, Kevin asks Reese what she remembers about that day. She can only recall a group of men in black storming in and tying everyone up. Then the next thing she knew, she was in the hospital. They told her that Kevin and Rufina came to save everyone, her sister dying in the process. Even Ayn refused to say a single thing about it when Reese asked, and Kevin says it's because the Grawls Ritter commander can't reveal that the orphanage was just being used as a smokescreen for an artifact that long needed to be sealed away. Kevin shows them to a section of the wall that opens up to a secret passage. Reese is baffled that a primal ground for storing artifacts was located beneath the Astor House Chapel. And continuing with his story, Kevin could only think about the danger Reese and the other kids were in due to the disguised Jaegers, so he decided to try and take them out on his own since Rufina's train was delayed. He had no problem with the vast majority of the intruders and was able to free all of the kids and the matron. However, some of the kids tell Kevin that Reese was taken by a Jaeger. Kevin was able to find where they went because Reese's hair ribbon had fallen out right outside that secret passageway, plus there were footsteps on the ground. Before they all proceed into the primal ground area, Kevin asks Reese if she remembers what he was like the very first time they met. 
and she responds that it was like he was consumed with blackness, with not a single bit of hope left in him. It was scary, wondering what must have happened to make him end up like that. It turns out that Kevin grew up mostly alone with his mom, since his dad had family elsewhere. The neighborhood kids picked on him because of his speech, which he got from his mom. But she took care of him, and Kevin loved her dearly. Things really took a turn for the worst when he was 7 years old though, since at that time, his father completely abandoned him and his mom. Kevin's mom fell into a deep depression, though her son did everything he could to try and cheer her up. Her health really began to suffer, and finally one winter morning, she decided she's had enough. She approached Kevin, her only child, and tried to strangle him, apologizing for failing as his mother during the attempt. His mom truly believed that they would both be happier together after leaving behind their suffering on earth. Kevin's will to live was strong though, so he was able to escape her grasp. Before he could even comprehend what he was doing, he was already running away barefoot in the snow. He wandered around outside for a while, trying to comprehend what had just happened. Hunger began creeping up on him though, and Kevin thought his mom would have successfully cleared her head by then, so he began to head home. He nervously entered, only to be greeted by the sight of his mother lying on the floor in a pool of blood. The Kevin of present time believes that that was the very moment his stigma was first carved inside him. Using his church emblem, he opens the seal to the primal ground and they all enter. This exact place was where Kevin caught up with the Jaeger who had kidnapped Rees. The man panicked when he spotted Kevin, so he dropped his gun and ran to the artifact called the Spear of Loa. It possessed a malignant function that transformed the wielder's body into that of a monster with incredible power. Kevin stood no chance against the transformed creature and was easily flung aside, leaving no one between the monster and Reese. The inhuman creature made to kill the unconscious girl, and that's when Kevin lost it. His stigma activated and absorbed all the artifact's power into itself. The outcome wasn't even a battle, since the countless spears that rained down from Kevin's new power completely slaughtered the Jaeger. He was reduced to tiny lumps of flesh strewn all over the sacred ground. Having been newly awakened to both the stigma's power and the absorbed artifact's strength, Kevin could not control his body and lost complete control of his actions. Rufina had arrived at that point, instantaneously piecing together what had happened. Her skills with the bowgun and templar sword effectively created space between Kevin and Rhys. And finally, Rufina approached Kevin with her arms spread wide in a protective stance. At the end of it all, Kevin returned to his senses to find a bloodied Rufina embracing him with countless spears pierced through her body. She drew her final breath, leaving Kevin nothing more than absolutely dumbfounded. Reese in the present has nearly the same reaction. Kevin goes on, recalling how Rufina in that moment reminded him of his mom and the time she came to strangle him. He was filled with feelings of betrayal and rage, so he pierced her body again with countless more spears. Kevin loved and wanted to protect them both so much, but he ended up being responsible for both of their deaths. Reese finally confronts Kevin, furious at him that this is the first time she's hearing the truth. Kevin states that he's fully prepared to accept Reese's vengeance, but Reese screams that he's being stupid. She rushes over and grabs him by the collar, having to explain exactly why she's so angry. Of course she doesn't want to avenge Rufina. She's furious because Kevin chose to shoulder this burden completely on his own. She explains that they're family, trying to understand why he never tried to talk to her or let her do anything to help him carry the weight of this tragedy. Reese has an epiphany, finally understanding why exactly Kevin hunts down heretics. It's not to atone for Rufina's death, but to punish himself for what he's done. And right at the exact same moment, the Lord of Phantasma finishes Reese's words, confirming that Kevin has been following a path of self-punishment. The figure congratulates the party at having made it this far, since the next plane is the very birthplace of himself and all the other planes. Kevin exclaims how he's finally ready to confront this figure's face, and that he's ready to face the Lord of Phantasma's true identity, Rufina Argent. 
The Lord of Phantasma throws off her mask, impressed that Kevin pieced together her identity. Though the Dominion notes that the answer was right in front of his face the whole time, he just didn't want to acknowledge the truth. Rufina says she knew Kevin was a weakling, and also brings up her connection to the Blade Lord. She first encountered him six years ago, and although they were enemies at the time, they were able to reach a sort of compromise. For this reason, he felt indebted to help her in Phantasma. Finally, Kevin says he's prepared for her to take him away, while Reese frantically tries to understand. Rufina taunts Reese, expecting her younger sister to have understood by now that she's merely here to fulfill Kevin's desire to hurt himself. The birth of her form in Phantasma, and all that had transpired to the group here, was all due to Kevin's desire for punishment. Kevin tells the group that everything will be over once he drops down to the hell created for a person like him. Reese attempts to attack Rufina, the latter teleporting away, curious as to why her younger sister would try to hurt her. Reese yells at this copy that she's not her older sister, since the real Rufina would never do something cruel like this. Reese then addresses Kevin, yelling that he promised he wouldn't do anything to make Rufina sad, so how could he possibly think that sacrificing himself would make everyone happy? The floating copy of Rufina asks Reese why she believes her older sister incapable of doing these things. If Kevin truly wants to be punished, why shouldn't she fulfill his wish? Reese has to remind them both of the first time they all met. In that moment, Kevin truly looked like he had completely given up on the world and just wanted to fade from existence, but Rufina wouldn't allow him to do so. She forced the chocolate down his throat and dragged him back into the world of the living whether he wanted it or not. Reese's words serve as a revelation that pierce right through Kevin, who drops his head and begins to tremble. Rufina butts in, telling Reese she's impressed that her younger sister is talking back to her. But once again, Reese furiously commands this copy to stop talking to her in such a way and defiling her true older sister. Rufina acknowledges that Reese is picking a fight, so she invites her to take Kevin's place. An ominous crack opens up in the ground, preparing to swallow Reese whole. She barely hangs on as copy Rufina paralyzes the rest of the party with the evil eye. The crack widens further, and Kevin screams at Rufina to stop. Though this copy tells Kevin that this can be considered further punishment, since Reese will be taking his place in Gehenna for all of eternity. Reese yells at copy Rufina to go ahead and do her worst, claiming that no matter where she ends up, she'll live and will return to Kevin. In response, copy Rufina allows the crack to completely swallow up Reese, prompting Kevin's shriek and release of his stigma. He breaks out of the evil eye and launches after Reese. Reese falls unconscious as she plummets head first into the fiery inferno, the countless screams of lost souls echoing in the background. Kevin trails after her and gives her a good conk on the head for taunting Rufina and sacrificing herself for him. He's self-aware of his own faults though, and stops himself from reprimanding Reese too harshly. He tells her to take a good look around the seventh plane they found themselves in, and confirms that this fully realized copy of Gehenna, where Rufina sent him herself, was the idea his own twisted mind created as his ultimate punishment. At first, he believed that sacrificing his life so that everyone could escape Phantasma would help him live up to Rufina's memory, but he's now realized that this plan would not have made her happy at all. They both remember the real Rufina and how she never condoned self-sacrifice as its own virtue. She only sacrificed herself that day because there were no better options for the unconscious Reese and the mindless Kevin. Kevin finally says it's no time to stand around lamenting past failures, since they better start walking to get out of here. Since Reese is down here with him, there's no way they're staying a second longer than they have to. Kevin firmly resolves that they're both getting out of here, no matter what it takes. As they make their trek through the molten Gehenna, they encounter various devils and fiends that they previously fought in the other planes. Eventually, they come across one of Kevin's old torments blocking their path forward. The fiend is the wretched form of the Bishop Owen who headed Aster House during the Jaeger takeover. It turns out that he was the one who hired the Jaegers to attack the orphanage 
simply for the sake of revenge after his excommunication from the church on corruption charges. This oozing creature begins repeating its miseries, blaming Kevin for his suffering in this hell. It begs for help, so Kevin coldly states that he can grant him death and eternal rest as a grimoire. After defeating Owen, Reese seems like she's at a loss for words, but there's no time to dawdle. They continue on and come across another fiendish blob. This one is the form of the child Elmer, who was transformed into a horrible flesh-eating monster by a devil-worshipping cult. At the time, Kevin tried every kind of thaumaturgy on the kid, but was unable to restore him to his human form. It begs Kevin to let him eat him, since he's so terribly hungry, but Kevin only accepts to put him down a second time. The poor ghost screams that he doesn't want to die before charging at them. But when it's finished, Kevin chuckles that he didn't even want to get out of bed the entire week after this horrific encounter. But Elmer was one of his first targets, and now his job is pretty much always like this. Reese embraces Kevin from behind, wishing that he would have relied on her instead of torturing himself alone like this. But he was honestly afraid that Reese would grow to hate him as he wallowed in his self-punishment. He couldn't bear if their bond ended up completely severed, so he just avoided her. But Reese calls Kevin a variety of names for even thinking such a thing, then tells him that instead of worrying about her, he should rely on her going forward as they press on through Gehenna. They finally reach the ghost of Kevin's mom. She repeats the very last apologies and words that she ever said to her son before rushing at them. After defeating her, Kevin tries to make light of the situation with his joking facade, but Reese shouts at him that he doesn't have to force himself to talk. Lowering his head, he admits that he's been running away from his mom's death ever since that day, but he now feels like he can accept that it happened. After a final push forward, they reach the gates of Gehenna. They're at a loss of how to force the gates open though, since the testament say nothing about how it can possibly be done. Out of nowhere, Wiseman interrupts them and appears before the massive door. Kevin says he was expecting to run into him here eventually, calling him the worst sinner the church has ever seen. During their exchange, it's revealed that before Wiseman's assassination, Kevin's status as Fifth Dominion was kept quiet under the wraps so that he could serve as the Grawls Ritter's trump card. The plans to defeat Wiseman even began shortly after Kevin first received his stigma. Kevin and Reese learn another truth about Phantasma, that this world was thrown into a state of confusion after the disappearance of the Oriole and desperately tried to turn to another master. It ended up latching on to the person with the deepest trauma present and found that it could create a copy of itself using Kevin's stigma. Wiseman tries his own shtick again, making a proposition that he could open the gates if Kevin chooses to cast his humanity aside, becoming an emotionless being free from regrets and trauma. The professor says he's willing to overlook his resentment towards Kevin just to realize his ultimate goal in life and death alike, the creation of a true superhuman. Reese makes the defense for Kevin as the latter remains silently pensive. But Kevin finally steps forward, first admitting that his reckless emotions are responsible for the current phantasma. However, he recalls the chocolate from Rufina and how before that time, he was crushed beyond all measure, resigned to give up right then and there. But that first meeting with the girls gave him the strength to keep pushing forward through every adversity afterwards, and that's why he has to turn down Wiseman's offer. Things don't look so good though when Wiseman summons both gatekeepers of Gehenna, but for the first time ever, Kevin summons the true light side of his stigma. It's no longer a red color, but a glowing white. And he earns a new S-Craft, the Spear of Ur, that is particularly effective against devils. Kevin and Reese are able to defeat the three insanely powerful figures, but then are met with something even more unbelievable. Good old Gilbert runs up to where they're standing, then collapses before them. Reese even begins to suspect that Gilbert may be secretly working with the Lord of Phantasma, but he has no idea what she's even referring to. Though unfortunately, as they were wasting time talking, the devils that were chasing Gilbert surround them. 
but right in the nick of time, the gates burst open, allowing the rest of the group to come to the rescue. They somehow all have the time to make a comment, and Elise even wondering why Gilbert is with them. Celeste is able to pinpoint their location since the cube was on them, and so she immediately began constructing a path to this plane. The others bravely charge in and create an opening for the three, bringing an end to the chapter. Back in the garden, Kevin finally comes clean about everything. He says that no apology is enough to make up for what he's put everyone through. But Estelle butts in, saying she doesn't get why he feels the need to apologize so badly. Everyone dishes out their own brand of reassuring Kevin that he shouldn't beat himself up so much over this. Even Ren says that it's a good thing Phantasma chose Kevin's stigma to latch onto over anything else, since its sheer power allows this world to exist in a state of order. Kevin is overcome at the group's acceptance and forgiveness of him, especially since he was just using them all back in second chapter. Filled with new resolve, Kevin says the time has come to meet their final objective here. However, they're all at a loss of where Rufina actually is. Just then, Celeste appears and says she's figured out the general vicinity of the Lord of Phantasma's location while they were all having their reunion. She's currently residing in the vast wastelands that exist outside the plains they've come to know. The group then faces a tough dilemma, since Celeste can't place monuments too far outside the garden, and the group doesn't have the time or resources to traverse such a vast space on foot. But Tita comes up with the idea that because Phantasma draws on people's thoughts and desires, they may be able to get the Arce up and running if they all wished for it. Celeste believes this should be possible, but warns them that once they leave for the wastelands on the Arce, they'll no longer be able to return to the garden since they'll be out of range. This is their last chance to make final preparations, then they're launched into the final chapter of the game. Once all preparations are made, they board the Arce and prepare the ship for the final operation. As long as every person on board pictures the Arce cruising through the air, Celeste is able to channel their thoughts into reality. They take off through the different dimensional planes and are able to reach greater speeds than the actual Arce is capable of due to their combined thought power. They reach the end of the planes in no time and blast their way through into the vast barren wasteland. On their way to Rufina, they catch wind of a pursuing Archaism, the very same Dragion model that Lo once commanded. Captain Schwartz reluctantly commands the RC to turn around and intercept the dangerous enemy, but Gilbert says there's no need. He claims that they're about to witness a true hero in action, then heads outside. Since this world works on people's thoughts, he's able to call his Gia Posh and heads off to intercept the Archaism for them. Everyone is understandably surprised that he's battling well, but no one truly believes he'll be able to take the enemy down. They're about to turn around to help, but he cuts in on the main monitor, telling them to continue onwards. With uncharacteristic humility, he says that he wouldn't have been much help in their final battles anyway, so the least he could do is distract this pursuer. He'll catch up to them once they're able to safely escape. They both pray for each other's success, then the Arce pushes on at max speed. Unfortunately for Gilbert though, two more Dragons appear in hot pursuit. They finally reach a gargantuan castle that completely dwarfs the Arce in size. The massive door opens, beckoning them in to this final destination. Inside, Rufina's voice welcomes them to Phantasmagoria, which appears to resemble the Great Cathedral in Arteria. She draws everyone's attention to the four doors, stating that Kevin and Reese, along with two others, must enter the great entrance, while all who are left must fill out the ranks in equally numbered groups. Rufina hopes that the banquet at the end of each hall is to their satisfaction, then leaves them to make their final party decisions. Finally, all four teams are seen entering the doors simultaneously, allowing the player to decide which order to proceed through the halls. The first team makes their way through beautiful but eerie corridors, encountering heavenly beings on the way. Encouraged by the final chest messages they'll ever be seen in the Sky Trilogy, they press on and finally reach a massive set of doors. They're greeted by a gigantic archaism that looks like a golden version of Ren's Potter Modern. 
The next group proceeds through various corridors in a similar fashion until they reach their own set of gigantic doors. Inside theirs is a similar archaism to the one that was fought at the bottom of Gransel Castle back in first chapter. The last of the lower hall teams makes its way past the enemies and successfully reaches a set of massive doors. A gigantic red version of the dragon Ragnard is waiting for them inside. It's finally Kevin and Reza's turn to advance through the Great Hall. The four approach the doors waiting at the end, Reese and Kevin stealing themselves for the final confrontation with Rufina. Then they enter. Inside, Rufina expresses her honest surprise that Kevin turned down Wiseman's proposal down in Gehenna, to which he replies that he probably would have won along with the professor if Reese hadn't been there. Kevin still acknowledges that his past regrets are still a part of him, since people just don't change very easily. He realizes that if he's unable to defeat Rufina here and now, Phantasma's currently contained effects will begin seeping into the real world soon. It'll be a slow process that eventually blurs the lines between this world and reality, such as ghosts beginning to appear in the real world. Rufina even proposes that Phantasma may be the best answer for reality since people only need to wish for world peace and it could be granted to them. But Kevin immediately denies that proposition. There's a reason why the original peoples living in the Oriole's time had to lock it away in order to ensure humanity's future. Kevin remembers how the real Rufina never solved problems by force, instead looking to collaborate with others to find the best solution. By forcing Kevin to eat the chocolate and face reality, he learned from her example that life doesn't always go the way people want it to. The only way to make a better world is for people to work together to achieve that goal. Kevin reflects on how much he didn't know, how much he didn't do, how much he ran away before his experience in Gehenna. He understands that the example Rufina set is a long ways off for him, but he's prepared to keep walking in that direction. Since Kevin keeps placing her on a pedestal, Rufina asks how he expects to defeat her if he feels like he's inferior. Kevin says he probably wouldn't be able to if she was the real Rufina. He accuses this imposter of being the copy of his stigma that was created here half a year ago after the Oriole's disappearance. The Crimson Stigma rises above them and introduces itself as Anima, this world's very center of existence. It warns that if any of the other three teams should fail, they will all be trapped in Phantasma forever. Then the final set of boss battles commence. Each of the other three teams successfully take down their respective enemy, then the Crimson Stigma transforms into its battle form. There are many stages in this final fight, first requiring Kevin's team to destroy seven pillars, each weak to a different elemental art. Once the pillars are down, Anima is no longer immune to attacks. After dealing with a couple more forms, Kevin, Reese, and their team is finally victorious and watch on as Anima explodes, leaving the light side of Kevin's stigma behind. Kevin and Reese find themselves in the farewell arena again, the real Rufina appearing before them. She has been freed from the stigma's influence and says she's very proud of them and their friends for never giving up. However, the stigma is still within her, and while it's currently suppressed, it won't be forever. The last remnant of it needs to be destroyed, so she asks Kevin to do the honors. By doing so, Celeste's powers will be fully restored which will allow her to return all of them to the real world. Kevin makes sure that there's no other options, and Rufina sadly admits that there are none. But Reese asks her sister how she could even ask Kevin to do this, knowing how much it hurt him in the past. And furthermore, Rufina knows it'll be hard on Reese to say goodbye, but they must face reality. She tells Kevin one more time to kill her and return to the real world with his friends. He lines up his bow gun, but before he can fire, Reese exclaims that she'll do it with him. She's tired of being left behind by the two of them, unable to do anything. This time she'll be there to carry the weight of Kevin's sin with him. Kevin's development shines through, since instead of denying her, he thanks her and the two line up the bow gun again together. 
Rufina warns them that their desire to follow in her footsteps will be filled with pain and difficulties, but Kevin and Reese are ready for the challenge. Rufina sees the resolve on their faces and encourages them to go even further than her and to reach the places she's never been able to grasp. They say their final goodbyes and launch the arrow, Rufina and the copied stigma finally dissipating for good. Reese begins sobbing, but Kevin encourages her, saying that they'll keep following Rufina's example, and when they finally reach it, they'll find her waiting for them. The two finally come to, to see everyone worriedly surrounding them. They're all relieved that Kevin and Reese have finally woken up, and after they're caught up to speed, Celeste prepares the entrance to the real world. After being together for so long though, it's hard to believe that they all must go their separate ways now. So Richard and Zinn take the initiative, saying that they'll be here forever if they don't begin departing now. They're glad for what they learned along the way with everyone else, then they run up the stairs through the doors. Olivier and Muller are next, the former becoming rather emotional. He asks Shira to please give some thought to his brazen question, everyone realizing that something big happened. Finally, Muller warns them that Erebonia is headed for turmoil and advises the rest to avoid any non-essential travel there. Everyone wishes them luck, then the prince and his closest confidant take their leave. Shara and Annalise are next. They remind everyone that the improving oral communications make it easier than ever to reach them just by contacting the Gransel Guild branch. Annalise tells Ren to really think about if she likes Estelle and Joshua or not, and to just follow her heart for this one. Then the two run through the doors. Agate and Tito follow the goodbye train. The young girl telling Ren that she waits for the day she, Estelle, and Joshua all return to Liberal together, and Ren just replies that Potter Mater is up for all challengers. Agate, in his characteristic way, encourages Kevin to keep moving forward, then the two are off. Chloe and Julia step forward, the princess reassuring Josette that she had a great time with her and looks forward to spending more time together in the future. The copy of Celeste reveals to Chloe how the real Celeste was just as intimidated and unsure of her capacity to rule when she was just beginning. Queen Alicia surely felt the same way when she first became Liberal's monarch, so it's natural that it takes time to become a full-fledged ruler. Chloe is grateful for the encouragement, then she and Julia head off. Josette says goodbye next in a way she's only capable of, basically being the homewrecker in Estelle and Joshua's relationship, but she does say she had fun with her rival during her stay here. Estelle then turns to Ren, asking if she's okay since she's been silent for a while. The young girl asks how everyone can be smiling while saying goodbye. If everyone's so sad to see each other go, why doesn't everyone just stay instead? As long as a garden exists, they can make reality into whatever they want and enjoy time together forever. Joshua gets that it's scary to consider they may never see each other again, but Ren says she's not like that. She didn't cry when Lo died. But Joshua goes on, differentiating that knowing someone is gone for good allows a person to grieve and have closure, but not knowing when one might see a friend again can be harder to cope with. Ren screams that they're wrong, then collapses to her knees, while Estelle bends down and says no matter whether people love or hate each other, the fact is all people will die someday. That's why people smile, so they can focus on the happy memories and press on even if it turns out that they'll never see a certain person again. Joshua and Estelle finally come clean with their intentions, telling Ren they wish to invite her into their family. They can't force her, and the ultimate decision has to be hers, but right now, they're just trying to find her. Ren jumps away and says she'll never stop running, but her pursuers are prepared for that. Before she runs off, Ren says she hates them, but also that she loves them just as much. Estelle and Joshua take a moment to grieve Ren's initial reaction, but then they encourage each other. The two finally head out, Kevin commenting that Rufina's vision doesn't seem so far off after watching the way those two conduct themselves. 
but the ground begins to shake, and Celeste advises them to leave now. By the grace of Eidos, Gilbert surprisingly makes it to the exit in the nick of time. Celeste says she'll now begin her lengthy slumber, waiting until Phantasma finally finishes decaying, which would finally relieve her of her role here. But before then, she'll deactivate the power of the Recluse Cube once they've escaped. Kevin thanks her for everything, then he and Reese return to the real world. The end credits begin as all Trails fans tearfully sob at the end of the Sky Trilogy. Just kidding, we're treated to one more epilogue scene. The First Dominion is confirming the safety of Kevin's friends while over the phone with him. She's noticed that he's changed a lot, since the old him wouldn't have bothered asking about the safety or whereabouts of the people he's worked with. Finally, Kevin asks if it's possible for a Dominion to change his title, since he's found something else besides just hunting heretics. Ayn has a good laugh, but tells Kevin that it's not unprecedented. He starts listing off some terrible possibilities, and the scene fades into the bright blue skies as Ayn tells him he'll absolutely need Reese's help with his decision. And that's it. Wow, I never would have expected that this would end up longer than the third part to the Sky SC summary. Anyway, a condensed summary of the necessary lore from the Moon and Star Doors is up next, so consider subscribing so you don't miss out. Thanks for sticking around, and I hope I did justice to the Sky cast. So until next time, take care. See ya!